Hey, Sherry, and Julia. We're going to get started here, okay? If you want, just want to go in back, that's fine. Um, and we're still on this concept of God's sovereignty and how this interplays with these themes that run through Amos and he gives us in a chiastic, poetic form, okay? So the people, if the, and this is the question, if the people seek good, if they hate evil, if they seek the Lord, will they live? That's the question. Will that happen? Will they reverse this judgment that God has proclaimed sovereignly? Will that come to pass? That's sort of the question that we're examining here um, in this poem. If you remember, and think about the language that Amos uses so heavy, eight times to be exact, in his opening oracles, um, this can be sort of a point of confusion, isn't it? Because here we're told that he will not revoke his punishment. He will not revoke his wrath of destruction from Deuteronomy chapter 28, particularly. Eight times we're told that. So, why this call to repentance? This is, this is really interesting, I think. Some people think, well, you know, if the people change um, as directed in Amos 14, 15, but also Amos um, 4 and 5, if, if they change, then God will revoke or relent or repent this judgment. God will do it. I mean, he's done it before in redemptive history. But has he? Has he done it before? Can you think of any times that God has repented or changed his mind or changed his direction? What's the most famous time? Sort of an easy one. Can you think of the one out of Exodus after the golden calf incident? Right? This is the way our English um, uh, translations uh, put this. So the Lord changed his mind about the terrible disaster that uh, he threatened to bring to his people. The Lord relented. The Lord relented. The Lord repented. But does he? Does he repent? What's that word there? Now, these words in Hebrew are different words, okay? But they're often translated the same in English. So I've been very careful. When you see a teal highlight on here, it's one word. When you see a yellow highlight, it's different. So anytime I use a yellow highlighter on, these, on these, this deck, I'm talking about shub, this word that's used throughout Amos 1 and chapter 2. I will not revoke. I, I will not revoke this punishment. That's shub. This is actually a different word, and we're going to look at these together because that's the easiest way to understand them, together, collectively, okay? Because they, they play off one another, and that's, that's how they are meant to be understood. Um, so do you think that's true, that God changes his mind, that he changes his plan? Worse yet, does he change his will? Does he change his redemptive plan, the scheme that he's worked out throughout history? Now, we're going to come back to this passage in a minute, but it's going to take a minute, okay? My thought is that God never changes his mind. He never changes his plans or his will, his redemptive scheme of salvation, the terms of his covenant. That is not changing. That never changes in the, in the Bible. And it's going to take a minute to demonstrate that, okay? Just think of the implication if he does change his mind, if he does change his will or repent from his will, then our salvation is not secure. And think of all the biblical teachings from the Old Testament to the New Testament that tell us that we are totally secure in, in Christ. Now, what are some other ways that this word revoke is translated? This is the Hebrew word shub, and it's written in two different stems, and we're going to talk about both of them, okay? This word is a very common word in the biblical narrative. It's used um, over a thousand times in the Bible. It's actually the, the third most common verb in the Bible, shub. What it means is to turn back, return, um, most commonly in a directional sense. So in the Torah, almost all the time it's used, you go from one place to another. You know, man came from, in, in Genesis 3, 3, verse 19, man came from the dirt. That's how God created man. And he created a human from that, man. And then man sinned and transgressed. And then God said, you're going to return to the dirt. You're going to return to the dust. That's how it's used in a, in a directional sense. Um, and I'll show you a few more examples of those. Now, in Genesis 3, this is talking about a spiritual or physical death. What do you think? 
Definitely physical, because they came from the dirt, and they're going to return to the dirt. This is talking about a, a physical death. But the way that we think of physical and, and, and spiritual, we think about them differently. That comes from 19th century philosophy. That comes from something called uh, Cartesian dualism. Are you familiar with that term, Rene Descartes? Um, he, he developed this, this, in my opinion, non-biblical philosophy of the immaterial soul. It's not relatable to the Bible. Okay? When the Bible talks about these things, it's usually in conjunction. The soul is intimately tied to the body. That's why we are told of this resurrection of the body in the end of days. Okay? That's, that's what we're taught in the New Testament, but also throughout the Old Testament. Now, how did God make man physically? I already sort of said this to the night. From, from the dirt, right? He, he made him from the dirt. How did he make him spiritually? He breathed it in his nostrils. He breathed the ruach, right? He breathed the spirit into his nostrils. That's different, right? So his, his other creations was made through his voice, speaking them into existence. But man is created differently. That's a two-part creation, okay? Man's different than the rest of creation. We're meant to see that. And here, the word shub is a demonstration of that, okay? Um, this is important, and this is the first place that we sort of got to start. This is the first w place that this word's used. No, we're not going to look at all these words because, like I said, there's over a thousand of them. The problem is that our word, and I didn't actually know this, our word for repent does not mean this physical turning of directions. <laughs> did you know that? I thought that it did. I, had to look, I looked it up in four different dictionaries. <laughs> but according to Merriam-Webster, it only means a theological or a spiritual turning of directions. It only means that. It doesn't mean, I can't say... I'm on my way to work, I'm going to Saginaw, and I, but I forgot my license, so i got to repent and turn around, go back home, and then go back to work, get my license. Okay? I can't say that. That's according to Merriam-Webster, but also the Oxford Dictionary. And I even looked it up in some old English dictionaries, and I, I don't know where that comes from. The, where, it, where it comes from is the Bible. Okay? The word shub means a physical turning, but it can be used with a different stem to mean a theological or a spiritual change of direction, okay? It's more nuanced than the English. But the Hebrew actually has more, more, more uh, words than just that. This word, this word shub is not like our word repent. It's more nuanced. It's more comprehensive, okay? It sometimes means um, a spiritual turning and changing in directions as well, okay? So there's two stems of this word shub. They're called the hiphal and the kal stems. Not important that you know that, okay? But the hiphal stem is by far the most common. When you read shub in the Old Testament, more than likely, it's the hiphal stem. That's the most common, especially in the Torah, like what we just seen here. That's the hiphal stem, a physical change of direction. Man's up here, man will return to where he came, the dust. Okay? But there's also this cow stem. Let's look at the hiphal stem first. This is a physical motion or a physical change of directions. Genesis 22 5, Abraham and Isaac, they returned to their servants. Abraham said to his servants, Hey, me and Isaac are going to go up to the mountain, we're going to worship God, and then we're going to return to you. We are going to shub to you. Return. Okay? And Genesis 18 is, is really interesting. It's very unique because this is one of the very, very, very few times that God is the subject to the word shub. Okay? And pay attention. This is important. Okay? God comes to Abraham and, and Sarah and he says, you're going to have a child. And, and Sarah does what? She laughs at him. <laughs> and he says, look, I am faithful to my word. This is going to take place. And I'm going to return to you in about a year, okay? He, remember, he, he, was, he physically manifested himself to her. Th three men, remember? And, and, they, and Abraham made him a, a calf or a lamb or something. He, he made him dinner, right? And then and about a year from, now, from that time, in Genesis um, 20, physically manifested himself to, to Sarah. He returned to her in a physical way. He, the, the word is, is a different word. It says he, he re returned, but then it says he visited her. Okay, so God physically returned to Sarah in about a year. Okay, very uncommon for God to be the subject of this word. Okay, and if you look in the cow stem, the cow stem of this is never, God is never the subject in the positive, never once. Okay, 
God never, ever, ever theologically turns from his will or his plan or his direction. Okay? But coming back to the Hiffel, um, yes, so a, a few times God is the subject um, of this. Not common, though. Um, and then if you look at the cow stem of this word, shub, this is not a physical turning. This is an intellectual or a spiritual or a theological turning of something. This is like our word repent, right? Our word repent is, is like shub, but it's only the cow stem. It's not the hiffel stem, okay? It's more specific, less comprehensive. These passages deal with the covenantal community, their return to God in the form of repentance, right? That's our word, repentance. Um, or the movement away from evil towards God. This is not common, okay? It is more common in the prophets in particular. It's most commonly used in uh, the prophets. Jeremiah uses this, the cow stem of Shub, the most. I think he uses it like 50 times or so, or 40, 44 times. Um, Amos uses it 14 times, okay? And we're going to talk about those in a minute. Um, there's a couple other things I want to say about this. Oh, I think I said them. So, then coming back to um, Exodus 32, and let's just read this sort of the, the short story here. This is most of God. Why should the Egyptians say, after the golden calf incident, you know, God was going to wipe them out. He's going to take, take them out and destroy them. Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent, did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring and the stars of the heavens and all this land that I have promised you, I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from this disaster that he had spoken, bringing on his people. Now, this is really interesting, isn't it? Um, this, is, this is beautiful, okay? The word in yellow is what? Shub. Good. <laughs> You're paying attention. <laughs> the word in yellow is shub. That word in teal is not shub. That's a different word, okay? But the word... Shub, turn, what is that? Is, the, is that the hiffle uh, stem or is it the cow stem? What do you think? Turn from your burning anger. Physical motion or theological? No, it's theological. He's not turning physically, he's turning spiritually. Right? That, that's the cow stem. Remember, God never, ever, ever. Yeah, exactly. He doesn't do this. That, that's my point. God does not do this. I, I probably went out of order a little bit, but notice here. Oh, notice, Moses asks God to do two things. He does one of them. He doesn't turn. He relents. Okay? This is a major point in redemptive history. Okay, this is very, very important. Moses asked God to do two things. He only does one of them. He doesn't turn, okay? He doesn't call shub, all right? He doesn't do what Moses requests. He only does, he only relents, okay? This, this is really important, all right? God doesn't do that. God never calls, call stems the shub, all right? Um, now, the, for, first, something should be... I don't, I don't want to get too deep into this before I explain something else. This is covenantal language. Okay, and the first... The place that you know this is covenantal language is the word right in the middle. Remember. You guys remember hearing that word before? We, heard, we hear this all the time. In the Torah and the Psalms. Okay? That is key for covenantal language. Did you have a question, Mark? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, that is key for covenantal language. When we here remember something, um, like when we remember, what does that mean? What does it imply? If I remember my car keys, what does that imply? I forgot them. <laughs> Is it possible that God forgets something? Is that possible for God to forget? No. So is it possible that God remembers? It's not possible. Okay. What? 
sort of. It's an anthropomorphism is what it is. Okay, do you know what a mangrove tree is? Do you know what a weeping willow tree is? Why, why do we say weeping willow trees are weeping? Because they troop down. They look like they're crying. Do trees cry? <laughs> do, do trees have emotions? <laughs> no. We're, tr- we're ascribing a human characteristic to that thing that is not human. Now, sometimes in the Bible, the biblical authors, the prophets, ascribe human characteristics to God to tell us something about him. Moses is not telling us that God has forgotten anything. Moses is telling us that God is faithful to his covenant and to his covenantal people and to his elect. That's what Moses is telling us. And this is used all over the place. Okay? It's used all over the place. And it's almost selectively used. I'm going to take you through the first eight times this is used. Now, this is the... the, I I didn't skip any times that this word is used. Okay? Okay? At, at, in, in the beginning, okay? It's only used in this way. The first time that this word is used is in the story of Noah. Now, did you guys know that the story of Noah is a chiasm? You know what a chiasm is, right? We're in the middle of a chiasm in, in Amos. Do you guys know what the, the whole story of Moses, like six through eight or nine or whatever it is, that's a chiasm? Noah. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Noah. Noah. Okay. Gen- Gen- to say, yeah. What's the middle of that chiasm? What's the focal point of that chiasm? It's right there. God remembered Noah. That is, I mean, when you're reading that, it's like God remembered Noah, and that's the focal point. That is the obvious, in Hebrew, that's the obvious focal point. Moses is telling us something in the story of, of Noah, right? And it's also important to know that everything starts out as getting worse and worse and worse, and as God remembered Noah, then it gets better and better and better. It's the focal point, and it's the turning point in the story. So that's the first time it's used. And then God says later to, to, no, to Noah, that I will remember my covenant. Covenant. I will remember the everlasting covenant between God and his creation, between me and my creation. Okay? God is telling us, Moses is, God is telling us through Moses that God is faithful to his covenant. He can be trusted. He is the true one, the faithful one, the great amen. Remember, we've already talked about this a little bit. And then this, the next time it's used is in Genesis 19. Um, God was going to destroy the city, but he remembered his servant Abraham, and he preserved the, the Gentile remnant of Lot, right? He preserved Abraham's family. This is telling us something huge. Not only that God is faithful to his covenant, but he remembers the Gentile remnant that was going to be grafted in later, that we're going to see in a little bit here. Then God remembered Rachel. Why is it important that God remembers Rachel? I mean, she was barren, right? You see barren women all over the Bible. Sarah, Rachel, um, and then um, who is Judah's mom? Rebecca, right? Samuel's mom, right? There's, there's a bunch of them. Samson's mom. There's a bunch of them that are, that are barren. Why is it so important that God is faithful to Rachel, in particularly? She's the mother of Jacob. She's the mother of Israel, right? This whole part of the story is telling us about that seed the seed of woman in particular, that's going to crush the head of, of the serpent. If Rachel doesn't have a baby, we're in big trouble. Okay? Seriously. Um, and then it's, it's, ta- it's talked about in the negative. The next time it's used, it's talked about in the negative sense. When Joseph interpreted the dream for the cupbearer, and the cupbearer was saved, he was redeemed from prison, from death, right? And then he said, remember me. Does he remember him? He doesn't remember him. Okay, God remembers. God is faithful. Humanity is not faithful. Okay, we don't do this. And then, if you follow this into Exodus, God remembers His covenant with. Uh, this is the way Exodus starts. God remembers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in His covenant, particularly. And then, if you go a little bit farther, after He redeems the people out of bondage and slavery in, in Egypt, He tells His people to remember His story. Remember this history. We remember what I've done for you. Now, this is, this is disappointing. Okay? There's some people of the covenantal community today that think that it's, the time has come to unhitch the Old Testament from the New. I don't know if you're familiar with Andy Stanley's work. I think it's a grievous error. Okay? Um, the reason why we know God is faithful to his covenant and he is not changing 
is because of the prophets, okay? It's because of the apostles, but the apostles stood on the shoulders of the prophets, okay? If you take away the, apostles, the prophets, then the apostles don't have anything to preach, okay? This is important. Now, you can see this verbiage in the Psalms, too. I don't know, who's doing the congregational Bible reading? <laughs> yeah, just the other day we read Psalm 115, and in the middle of Psalm 115, God remembers his covenant, okay? Um, this is important. It's how this word's used. It's what we're supposed to be drawn to. Um, this doesn't mean, this, none of this language means that God forgets. It means that he's faithful. Um, uh, God has a will that he will carry out faithfully. He will not um, turn from it. He will not shub from it in the cow stem. He will never turn theologically from his will or his plan or his covenant. All right. Um, so coming down the back side of Exodus 32 here, um, what's going on? Now remember, Moses has asked God to do two things, and he only does one of them, okay? He doesn't turn. He doesn't turn from his anger. If he turned from his anger in his righteous judgment, he would be not just, okay? There has to be righteous judgment, okay? He relents. He relents. Some, there's a variety of ways. These words are not really similar in the Hebrew language, but they're often translated in similar ways. Sometimes they're translated in synonymous ways. This is not a good way to think about these two words here. If we confuse these words, then we confuse the character of God and the nature of God, Okay? So the teal word is commonly translated console, comfort, or rest. Okay? You know what word this is? Anybody? The word's nakam. 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 I'll come back to it in a little bit. Some of the other ways that this word's translated in this text is repent or change your mind. Um, in my opinion, these are not good translations to translate this word. Okay? I do not believe God changes his mind when it comes to his, his plan. Okay? I think he carries out his, his plan and his redemptive scheme quite, quite faithfully. Um, uh, um, yeah, it, I mean, if, if he doesn't, then we're, we're in big trouble, right? Our salvation's not secure. Okay? That's not true. We're told in numerous places throughout the biblical narrative that God is a faithful God. God never shoobs in the cow stem he never turns theologically or spiritually in the biblical narrative or in the biblical context. It doesn't happen, okay? Now, um, he does relent, okay? He does not come. He does, he does do this teal thing, okay? So that's what I want to look at briefly. What's this word? But before we do that, I want to look at these words together, and then I want to look at them one by one, Okay? Now, look at, these are not comprehensive, but the way that these words are translated in the New American Standard is shub is translated repent, a, vari a vari variation of repent, um, six, eight, ten times. Nakam is, and I'm, I'm, I'm mispronouncing that word, okay? I, I understand that. I'm not going to try to pronounce it correctly. <laughs> this is a very Hebrew, Hebrew sounding word, okay? Um, that word is translated repent or some variation of repent seven times. Okay, these are different words. Okay, they mean different things. Um, and before we, we get there, I want to look. Uh, the, the main thing that I want to show you here is that the Hebrew language is much more sophisticated than the English language when it comes to repentance. It has one word that can be mean that can mean a physical or a theological turning of directions. Okay, but then it also has another word which means something different. It means to comfort oneself or to console oneself or to feel sorry for oneself. What that word means literally, Nakam, is to breathe deeply or to breathe heavily. Like, it's a sigh, okay? It's a, it's a, that's what it means. That's the, the literal meaning of it. But it's translated as to comfort oneself or to console oneself. That's how it's usually used, okay? Okay. Um, the English doesn't do that. Now, you could say that our word repent is to feel sorry about our own sin, right? That's, that's one way that the, the word is used. But you could also say 
It's to turn from your sin and to turn from the behavior. Right? So our word for repentance, the way our English language describes this act, is not very sophisticated. It's not as sophisticated as the Hebrew language. The Hebrew language is, is an old language and it's an ancient language, but in some respects it's much more sophisticated than the English language. What's another way that's more sophisticated? <laughs> Remember about five months ago when we started this class? We talked briefly about the, the ways that the Hebrew word uh, language describes the human condition, right? Um, what, are, what are the words? Do you remember any of them? Sin, chata, iniquity, avon, and transgression, pesha. Okay? If I ask you as a Westerner, what's wrong with the human condition, you're not going to give those three words. What are you going to say? From a psychology standpoint. <laughs> <laughs> from a psychological standpoint, you know, human psychology book, they're going to say education. The reason why people do wrong is because they're not educated enough. Okay, it's not a very sophisticated answer. All right. Um, so that's one of the things I want to do. Looking at this, um, so the first thing I'm going to do is look at the word shub. Okay, and this word's way too common. It's used over a thousand times. I'm only going to look at it in the context of Amos. Amos uses this word 14 times, and every single time that Amos uses this, it's in the cow stem. Not a physical turning. He's not changing directions. Remember, this is poetry, so it's not surprising that he's only using this in the cow stem. He's only using this in a theological change of directions. Okay? Um, he uses it 14 times. The first eight times, Amos declares that the Lord will not shub from the punishment. He will not shub from the covenant. Remember Deuteronomy chapter 8, the consequences of the covenant. That's exactly what he's talking about. Chapters 1 through 2, and then he sort of carries it on um, in 3 and 4 a little bit. Um, he will not turn from his covenant with his covenantal people. He doesn't do that. We're told that eight times. Okay? Remember? So, so... When I, said, when I said that, I said, God never shoves in the cow stem, stem. This word, he's the subject here, but it's in the negative, okay? He will not do this, okay? Does that make sense? He doesn't do this, all right? Um, I, that's sort of confusing, but it, does that make, does that, do you understand that? God never shoves in the cow stem, sense. He never turns theologically or spiritually from his covenant or his will. He never does that, all right? Um, what God says will come to pa pass, specifically these eight times in chapters 1 and 2, he will not revoke, he will not turn theologically from his covenant. Because, why? He remembers. He's faithful. We've already been told that a million times from Noah, from Moses. Okay? But then in chapter 4, he does something else with this word. Five times in verses 6 through 11, he, God Amos, well, God tells us through Amos that the people do not turn back to me. Okay? He says that five times distinctly um, that God has withheld food, he's withheld rains, he's sent blight and pestilence, he's sent locusts, he's sent prophets and even death to his covenantal people to remind them time and time again of the covenant that he cut with them in the Torah the promise that he made to humanity, yet these people have turned from him. They turned away from him. And then five times, he says, even though I've done those things to remind you and to draw you back to me, yet you did not shub to me. Humanity does not turn to God. They only turn away from God. That's the way shub is used to humanity. We only turn away from God. And according to Amos and according to many other prophets, we do not turn to God in his direction. He tries repeatedly to get humans to do this. So eight times, eight times in Amos, we're told that God does not turn theologically. And eight times we're told that humans also do not turn theologically, but in the direction of God. Okay? That is poetically saying something very profound about the human condition. Okay? That is all the times that Amos uses the word shub except for once. So before I get to the problem, 
that comes up here is that how's God going to carry out his covenantal problem, his, co his covenant with humanity? If they won't turn to him, how's he going to fulfill that? Right? That's a problem. If we will not turn ourselves in the direction of, of God and his instructions, how is he going to bring a blessing to the nations? If we're incapable of righteousness and justice, how is God going to make this happen? That's a problem. Right? How is this blessing going to come to humanity if we will not return to him? Right? Well, Jeremiah talks about it in a little bit different way. When we were talking about this righteous branch a few weeks ago, he's got to do it. Okay? He's got to be our righteousness. Jeremiah says it in a little bit different way. Okay? And Amos says it in a little bit different way, but it's the same thing. Okay? He's got to be our righteousness. He's got to get that imputed onto us somehow. He's got to turn us around. Okay? Now, Amos doesn't know about any of this. Remember, Amos is writing from the 8th century B.C., but he gives us a clue at the end of his writing. And Bill, I'm going to step on your toes a little bit here. Sorry. Um, Bill, Bill's responsible for chapter 9. <laughs> I'm like I'm shooting Bill's horse is what I'm doing, metaphorically. <laughs> so forgive me. I'm sure everyone will forget when you get to it. <laughs> so, so feel free. I'll send you the slides. Okay. This is how Amos describes this, okay? This is how Amos describes what Jeremiah is talking about in 23 and what, what Ezekiel's talking about in, I think, um, 36, where he says um, he's got to give us new hearts and, and whatnot. Now, Amos doesn't know about any of this. Amos is one of the first of these covenant, covenantal lawyers, remember. He doesn't know about this righteous branch. He doesn't know about the stump of Jesse, Right? That becomes this righteous shoot. You know about that. This is the way he describes it. Um, I mean, he knows it's got to happen. He knows that mankind does not turn to God. Right? He laid that out in the first four, four chapters of, of his, of his uh, book here. But at the end of Amos, he gives us something totally awesome. Now, I'm going to read this in, in its entirety. Okay? Because there's, there's two things that are important here. And that day I will raise up a booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins. He's not talking about the stump of Jesse. He's talking about the house of David, okay, this dynasty of David that God promised in 2 Samuel 7 he's going to raise up an everlasting dynasty and a house for David that is going to reign forever, okay? That they may possess the remnant of Edom and all nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. This blessing to all nations. What's he talking about there? What's he talking about? Do you guys recognize that? That's quoted pretty closely in Acts chapter 15, when James stands up in the council of Jerusalem and says to everyone who's debating this whole Gentile thing, and he quotes Amos, he quotes Amos here, but he also quotes it with uh, Isaiah and I think Jeremiah, and he says, look, the Gentiles have been grafted in to the family of God, and we shouldn't be surprised at this because the prophet told us about this repeatedly, and then he quotes three of them. Amos is 17. All right? James tells us about that. That's unbelievable in itself, but it's not over. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will shub the fortunes of my people Israel and they shall rebuild the ruins of the cities and inhabit the land. Okay? Now, that word that I underlined, fortunes, that only means wealth in the human sense. So it's talking about people, okay? The more accurate way to translate that is captives or prisoners. God, Amos is telling us that God is going to turn his people who are captive, who are held bondage by sin and death, he's going to turn them around to him. Now, the other prophets talk about this in really cool ways too. Jeremiah said, what does Jeremiah say? Jeremiah says that he's going, to write, he's going to send his spirit and he's going to write his Torah on our hearts. Ezekiel says 
that he's going to take out our hard hearts of stone and he's going to put into our hearts, put into us soft, fleshy hearts. But Amos says he's going to shub us. He's going to turn us back to him. This is important in regards to God's sovereignty because we don't do this ourselves. We don't make our righteousness. We don't write the Torah on our hearts. And we don't replace our hard heart with soft, fleshy hearts. And we don't turn ourselves around. It's the Spirit of God that does that. Think of what, God, what Jesus said to Peter when he was talking to him. When, when Peter professed him as the Christ, he said, Blessed are you, son of Jonah. On you I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not withstand. He's talking about the people that are prisoners and captives in their own sin and death. And he's going to turn them around. He's going, he's going to get them. So that's what this means. That's what this word shub means. That's how it's used in the biblical narrative. That's how it's used in Amos. It's the same way. Um, then I think I think I got all of that. I mean, we talked about this last week, but in different contexts, didn't didn't we? Um, you see, the people, they're captives. They don't do anything to turn themselves around. We don't. Amos laid that out in chapter 4 very clearly. But it's been laid out in, in, in a bunch of different prophets. Okay, Without the Spirit of God, we don't turn ourselves around at all. He's the one who turns us around to him. He writes his Torah on our hearts. He replaces our hearts with soft, fleshy ones. And as you looked at last week, it's he who calls us. It's not the other way around. Okay? This should not be disheartening. This is comforting. Okay? It's God that does this. We have no pride in this whatsoever. Okay? So the second... Oh, this... The, I would just... The, the way that the King James translates that word fortunes is, is kept... That's the way a lot of the translations translate this. The ESV translates it as... Uh, um, differently as, as like a monetary sense. Um, okay. So the next word that I want to look at, and we got to look at these together, okay? Because they're, a lot of times in the biblical narrative, they're used together. This word, relent, relented, repent, it's translated a bunch of different ways. I, th I think it's not really understood all that clearly by a lot of scholars. Some understand it very well. Um, but you've got to look at it together. And a lot of times you've got to look at it with this word shub. Okay? And notice things. For goodness sakes, notice things like this. Okay? Moses asked God for two things, but he only does one. Okay? This is very important. He, God never changes his direction or his plan, but he does relent. He does relent. Okay, what does that mean? He does not come, right? He does, how, this word is most often translated to be sorry for, to console, right? It means, it means to sigh, to comfort yourself, okay? To console oneself. One of the ways that this is translated is after the period of mourning is done, okay? Um, Amos repeats, uh, oh, ah, let's see where I go next. Here's another way. Change your mind. Repent. I'm not sure these are great. The first place that this is translated, as words used, is in the story of Noah. Okay? We, we were just there, weren't we? So, in the story of Noah, um, God um, re, uh, well, let me just read this. Um, and um, Noah's dad called his son Noah, saying, out of the ground the Lord has cursed this one shall bring us relief, shall bring us comfort, bring us rest, as some translations put it, from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. It's a very typical way that this word is translated. Um, now, this is not used very often. This word is used three times in the, in the story of Noah. Okay, um, That's very typical usage. 
These are the other two times. The Lord regretted and the Lord felt sorry that he made mankind. I'm not sure those are great translations. I don't think he regretted things. That's, I mean, he sees these things as, as they happen. Does it make more sense to say he felt, he felt sorry for him? He consoled himself for what his creation has done to him? For what his, how his creation, how humanity has rebelled and transgressed? Does that make more sense? I don't know if you guys ever heard of um, this, uh, uh, this translation here. It's sort of an older translation. And Jehovah will lament that he made man. And he grieved that he made them. And Noah found grace in the eyes of Jehovah. Right? Jehovah didn't choose Noah to build a boat because he was such a good guy. He chose him because of grace. Okay? And then I'm going to skip this because we don't have a lot of time. But if you look at the way these words, especially um, Nakam, is used throughout the... It's so typical. I mean, it's, we just don't have time to look at all of these. What I do want to look at is in Amos. This is, this is really cool. In Amos, he uses this word twice. And it's both, both in the same time. I'm, now I'm going to shoot my own horse, Bill, because I'm doing chapter 7. Okay? <laughs> and I'm going to call out order a little bit. But I, 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 can't, I, I can't not mention this as I'm talking about these, this concept of God's sovereignty, okay? Amos rep repeats this poem twice. He's given three visions. Two of them are about the complete annihilation and destruction of, of God's people, okay? And, um, and it has to do with locusts and fire, okay? And God said these people have, I'm paraphrasing, but God said saying these people have turned from me. They, they, have not, they will not turn to me. They're gone, okay? They're going to be annihilated, and then Amos says two times the exact same words. O oh Lord God, please forgive. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. Then the Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. So Amos asks God to forgive the people of their sins. Does he do it? He does something else, doesn't he? He doesn't do that. He relents. He comforts himself. He consoles himself. He does, he holds back his wrath for a time, okay? There's going to be a time when his wrath is not withheld, okay? And, and we're going to get there, okay? But look at how Amos uses this. This is typical, okay? All the prophets talk about God. Like, you know how I said God never shoobs in the cow sense? He always nakams. He does this one all the time. If you look at the prophets, if you look at the Torah, if you look at the Psalms, he's doing this all the time. He constantly does this. He doesn't do it one time. There is one time in the Old Testament that God does not nakam. There is one time in the Old Testament that God does not comfort himself. There is one time that God does not console himself. There's one time that God holds his breath. He doesn't sigh. Okay? It's in Psalm 110. Now, if you don't know, Psalm 110 is the most quoted passage of the Old Testament and the New Testament. It is about the it is a messianic psalm about the coming Savior. It's about Yahweh himself, as we find out, coming to dwell with his people. You see, we know from the Torah and from all the prophets that humanity cannot turn to God. We don't do it, okay? We don't, have, we don't have his Torah written on our hearts. We don't have soft, fleshy hearts. We have hard hearts of stone. That ha those have to be replaced by the Spirit of God. That's our problem, okay? It's well described throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Just start reading almost anywhere, okay? That's the problem. We need a priest, we need a king who is faithful and will not fail, like the Levitical priesthood failed, like the dynasty of David failed, like the judges failed. We need a faithful and a um, we need a faithful priest and a king who will remember, okay? Because humanity forgets, okay? The cupbearer does not remember. That's us, okay? I don't know if you know that, but in the story of Joseph, we're not Joseph. <laughs> Okay, that's Jesus, all right? We're the cupbearer, all right? Um, when did Jesus, 
When did Jesus become a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek? When did he come, this priest, this king? When did he literally take the seat at the right hand of God? According to John, it was when he was lifted up. And in Psalm 110, David tells us that's the one time in history when God does not comfort himself. It's the one time that he holds his breath. All throughout redemptive history, you see God sighing and comforting himself and holding back his wrath, not wiping us out completely, but always saving a remnant. He does it everywhere in the Old Testament, like a hundred times, okay? But one time in the history of creation, he holds his breath and he lets his wrath fall on his innocent son. That Pilate declared, this man is innocent. I find, no fi- I find no fault. In the wrath of God, that was intended for the people, for, for Noah, that was intended for the people of Israel, that was intended for David, that we see in, in Samuel, and Saul, and all of these people, the wrath of God that was intended for them fell on the son as he was hanging on the tree. So, That's the one time that God does not sigh, doesn't comfort himself. He doesn't console himself. When his righteous judgment falls on his innocent son who's on the tree, that's when he holds his breath. Does that make sense? I'm done with that part. Okay, I told you that this part is going to take a while to get through because there's so much history in this chiasm, and you can't look at it independently. If you look at the the book of Amos in a vacuum, you will not understand it. These words that he uses, he uses in very typical ways, okay? Just like the Psalms, just like King David, just like the prophets, just like Moses, he uses them in a very specific context, and he's using them in a way to bring us to a transcendent truth that's telling us not about ourselves primarily, but about his son, about him, okay? That's true of any of the books of the Bible. Too often that's done is that they're presented in the back of the Bible. The only way that they're powerful is when they're all together. Like we start next week by. A, name, a sermon that I heard that's about this passage right here. And the way that the guy starts off is saying that the only way that we can have a good life is to by seeking God. Well, seeking God and, getting, and, and forsaking evil, it doesn't have to do with this life. It has to do with the life to come. Okay? Um, the, if, if you read Amos in a vacuum, you're going to get that. You're going to get the prosperity gospel. You're going to get the health and wealth, um, word of faith movement. You're going to get, um, oh, what do they call it? You're you're going to get something that is not biblical, okay? But you you can't do that. You've got to look at Amos in the context that he's writing, okay? He's He's talking about Moses. He's talking about Jesus, okay? He talked, about it, he talked about it dozens of times in the, in the Gospel of John. That's one of the things that John points out, this choosing that God first has to choose us. He first turns us before, we can't turn to him, okay? I mean, and the reason why he takes that for granted is because the prophets make it so clear. I mean, and Amos, Amos writes a whole chapter about it. Am I not going to, did I go too far? He writes a whole chapter about this five times. We, as, as humans, do not do that. It's something that's not a part of our nature. Um, I guess I finished earlier than what I thought I was going to. Any questions? When you say we can't turn to God, that's not the same thing as how He turns us. <laughs> that's all. So you're saying there, there's only certain people that are going to... No, I'm not saying that. Okay. I'm saying that God turns us. I'm, I'm, saying, I'm saying only what the prophet says. I'm saying that he turns, oh, where was I? That he turns us. I'm only saying that, okay? 
you probably weren't here last week. I'm sorry I didn't get it recorded. But we, we talk about this concept in three different types of literature. We talk about it in poetry, in narrative, and in discourse, and how this takes place. Okay? If you want, later, I'll, um, I offer who wants to talk about this further, to give me a text or call or email, and I'll, I'll buy him breakfast or lunch. Nobody took me up on that this week. So if you want, I'll, I'll, um, I'll come over and explain that to you, and we can talk about Romans chapter 9. Paul's pretty clear about that. That, one, humans have a responsibility and a choice, but also it is not us that make that initial move towards him. It is God that turns us. It is God, it is the Spirit that writes the Torah on our hearts. It is the Spirit that replaces our hearts. Okay? The significance in that is pride. Um, the, the apostles write and tell us that we cannot, we, we, we literally cannot take pride in our salvation. Why? Because we don't choose him. It's him that chooses us first. Does that make sense? Do you see how that's a slight difference? And I'm not saying it makes um, logical sense. I'm saying that's what the Bible says. Okay? Uh, you, 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 probably, you probably missed a lot from last week, Sherry. But, but one of the things is that some of these things we are not going to have the answers to in this life. The only thing that we can do is trust in this life. Does that make sense? Go ahead. Oh, I thought you were going to say something. Anybody else? Okay. Okay.